Welcome back to the Mike Forrest Podcast. It is, of course, your host, Mike G, back from Dallas, Texas. Had a good time in Dallas, Texas. Big shout out to Black Dog Traders, the Land Cruiser, now uh, Overland Vehicle aftermarket shop in Dallas, Texas, for allowing us to use your space. It was an amazing event. I mean, I had one day through a post I posted on Instagram that was aggressively suppressed to get that out. I wanted to do it at Black Rifle Coffee. Knew there wasn't going to be a lot of room, not a lot of time, and they weren't doing events during Memorial Day, and I get that. So I decided to flex and go, hey, anybody provide a space where we can host 100-plus people? And big shout-out to Austin and the guys at Black Dog Traders for allowing us to do that. In a very short period of time, less than 24 hours, we got a post out and had 120 people show up to that event. Uh, the entire point of the event was to bring awareness to active shooter um, training because there's not a lot of it in the United States. Had a lot of teachers that showed up and I appreciate everybody who came out to see me. Also talked about stop the bleed and glossing over the surface, which I never like to do, especially in important information. But we got through tourniquet application and just scratched the surface because I want you guys to get trained. I want you to come out and physically physically get trained. It doesn't have to be from Phil Craft Survival. It can be. But anybody. Tactical combat casualty care, tactical training, uh, mindset training, resilience, everything that you can do to be best prepared. So here's the great news. Um, I went there for a Panama reunion, by the way. Saw my good buddies Joe, Sam. Joe Lynch. Um, I went there for a reunion to interview a buddy of mine, Joe, who was a platoon sergeant in the 82nd Airborne Division when they jumped into Panama December 20th, 1989. Man, long time ago, it seems. And all of the, the experiences he shared with me and my media guy, John Park, was just like awe inspiring, man. It was an amazing opportunity to capture and archive American history. And we're going to do a lot more with Joe because we're doing a Stories of Survival with Joe. If you haven't seen the Stories of Sur Survival, it's out on Black Rebel Coffee's YouTube channel. The first one we did was on an Air Force pilot who ejected um, at a high rate of speed, killing his co-pilot instantly. And he went through this story of survival that gives you an insight to some of the tactics and techniques and sometimes just luck that allow people to survive. I'm very interested. It's the a most interesting question I ask myself all the time, why do people live and why do people die? And I think I spend my most of my time in trying to activate that and communicate that through different means because it's my passion. It's what I do as a CEO and owner of a company called Phil Craft that specializes in preparedness. But also it's my personal passion. Uh, I want people to live their best lives. Um, so here's some good news about Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas. We're coming. We're coming to Dallas-Fort Worth. Right now, we're trying to find a piece of commercial property between Dallas and Fort Worth in a very heavily populated area. We're trying to stay out of Dallas County, which is super liberal. Uh, we want to be on the outskirts, a little bit of a more rural county. Not so far rural that we're out of the way. We still want to make it convenient. But that area of Grapevine is the area that I just looked recently and it's a good community, good people, but uh, can attract the surrounding area. What are we going to be bringing? Well, one, I'm committing. I already committed this morning to Sean and to Kevin Owens, our training directors for Phil Craft Survival, that I will be in Dallas, Texas four days per month once that stood up to do media, to do a training course once a month in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. I'm doing that same thing in Utah at the end of uh, June I think June 24th and 5th or 25th and 26th, whatever that weekend falls on Saturday, Sunday, I'll be doing gunfighter pistol and gunfighter carbine in Spanish Fork. If you haven't visited Spanish Fork Black Rifle Coffee, my good buddy Neil and Casey that own Ready Gunner, my favorite gun shop in Utah, um, they just opened their Black Rifle Coffee and I went there yesterday. Uh, pretty good time and it's right down conveniently for me from my training facility that I have with Kafaro. Uh, Aaron Snyder and uh, Chad, the owner, have allowed us to use their land gracefully. And so we're using Kafaro's training site in order to conduct this training in pistol and carbine. Big shout out to Kafaro 
in my opinion, the best manufacturer of outdoor backcountry hunting equipment in the world. Um, man, I'm excited about Dallas Fort Worth because I want to offer CQB to civilians for the first time. We're going to do CQB level one, level two, and level three. Level one is going to be a break. We've taught this many places and at many instances throughout Philcraft's uh, time, but this is going to be simulation, simulations based and self protection home defense based. So imagine how do you clear a space and work on the footwork and the considerations for single man CQB or single person CQB. Level two is going to include obstacles, furniture, the list goes on. It's just going to be in the advancement of level one. And level three, we're doing scenario based training around that. We're also bringing self protection to Dallas Fort Worth, a course that Kevin Owens, Amber, um, and myself kind of started, made this hybrid version of it. And Kirsten was in the uh, original courses, who's, of course, a former Charlotte police officer and SWAT officer that we hired that does self-protection training across the United States. And this is important because it's scenario-based training that is setting you up for how you're going to react or act, period, under stress. Many people have an idea because they work technical training and proficiency of their capabilities on flat ranges, but they don't understand how they're going to act or potentially react while they're going through a sympathetic nervous response, while they're nervous, while they're, you know, full of cortisol, stress hormones, adrenaline, the list goes on. So that is going to be coming to Dallas as well. I also will have a responsible citizens course once a week. Every Wednesday, typically we run it in the evenings for all the local citizens who want to attend. That's absolutely free. That's our way of giving back to the community, but building a relationship between police officers, sheriff's departments, federal law enforcement, and the civilian populace. The responsible citizens that we do in our own backyard here in Heber City and in North Carolina are ran by subject matter experts, including law enforcement officers in our own backyard. We'll be doing that um, as well. We'll have a pro shop. We'll be selling uh, the normal swag, but also the normal equipment that Phil Crass sells. I'm just looking forward to it, man. I'm a big fan of Texas, always have been. Um, I don't like the heat because I'm not a big fan of heat. Um, got Norwegian and Korean blood. We're used to kimchi squatting in, in ice cold, frigid rice patties. But I, I appreciate Dallas and the people. And as things start to fall apart, man, it's going to be a crazy ride. I anticipate, uh, especially with the pre- current president of the United States, that is a complete and utter train wreck. I've seen poor leadership, but I've never seen the acceptance and willingness of the American people to just take incompetence as the leader of the free world. It's embarrassing. um, It's demoralizing, but it's also very dangerous. If you haven't seen it recently, uh, the Canadian prime minister, and let me see if I can find the article because I want to read the latest headline. Let's go ahead and look this up. Getting to your news, by the way. Canada, or let's put... Canada. Canada bans pistols. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, the latest headlines from New York Post 15 hours ago. Canada moves to ban sale of handguns and sweeping bill introduced after Uvalde, Texas. Now, what's interesting about that is um, they did this recently a couple years ago in banning assault rifles or weapons. And here we are two years later, and they're going after pistols. This one's from the BBC. It's a little bit more legitimate, a little bit more moderate. I mean, they're still liberal, but a little bit more moderate. Canada should introduce a total ban on the buying and selling of all handguns, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has said. His government is proposing a new law that would freeze private ownership of all short-barreled firearms. The legislation would not ban the ownership of handguns outright, but would make it illegal to buy them. Mr. Trudeau's proposal comes days after the deadly shooting at Texas primary school. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let me say this one more time um, for my listeners. If you haven't heard it recently, let me just try to remind you of something. The second amendment and the inherent rights that you're born into the self inherent right to self protection and defense 
crosses over into the Second Amendment, but also has a lot to do with the balance of powers between government and its people. Now, I'm not a fringe guy. I don't like all these activists, and I don't like all these extremists on either side, left or right. And I'm certainly, I certainly don't live a life personifying my 2A experience. Uh, I do things about it, like I look at legislation. I email congressmen and women. I build those relationships. I educate through my company. But I certainly, certainly don't shout at the top of my lungs about Second Amendment rights because that isn't very proactive. What I've seen a lot of uh, in recent, this is as recent as the shooting that took place in Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, where 10 people were killed, where a racist went into a school or into a, uh, a grocery store, excuse me, from a school, he was a high school kid, and killed 10 people with an assault rifle. Then we look at what's, what took place in Uvalde, Texas. Um, I believe with assault rifle was what they've proven as well. Now, the idea that we need to ban guns or enact a, an assault weapons ban is on the table. Now, what I do with trying to be reasonable, because people think I'm unreasonable, the, the hate mail and the hate DMs that I've received, um, I'm not surprised by, um, but it's disappointing because I'm not somebody who tries to jump to conclusive conclusions unless I've analyzed the information that's available. You know, the facts. Here's what we do know about the assault weapons ban. It took place between 1994 and 2003, I believe. If I could spit that off the top of my head. It was a 10-year ban. The ban was supposed to stop mass shootings and reduce it. According to the liberal media, that's not the case. It didn't do that. In fact, there was an insignificant connection between the reduction of mass shootings and the assault weapons ban. You know, I saw a meme the other day that was posted by uh, somebody on social media, and it said uh, the logic against 2A. Um, a sheep is killed by a wolf, and then the sheep decide amongst themselves that the teeth of the wolf are the problem. So then they pull all their teeth out. And then the wolf comes back and kills them all. That's how this works, guys. But it's also the logic and reasoning behind, is it the person or is it the tool? 19 terrorists on 9-11 took down four aircraft killing 3,000 people in one of the biggest, most significant terrorist attacks in the world with box cutters and airplanes. They didn't use a pistol. They didn't use a carbine. They used airplanes. Now, I want you to understand that evil people that decide to commit an act of evil do not follow your gun-free zone. They don't follow your ordinance or your law or your mandate because they're criminals that break the law. So what you're saying is when you want to get rid of guns, because that's what you're saying, that's what the politicians on the left are saying, you're saying, I want to limit law-abiding citizens' capability of protecting and defending themselves while empowering, because you're empowering criminals and evil people, because they know now there's going to be soft targets, including individuals who can't have firearms. It's one of the reasons why crime is rampant and left ran restricted, all amendments seemingly, restricted metropolitan cities in this country. Every crime statistic is up. You can't argue that. You could look it up. So what we're actually saying is we're limiting or reducing or eliminating completely a law-abiding citizen's right to self-defense. Now, the argument would be, well, Mike, don't you think there should be some regulation? Yeah, sure. A background check is completely within the realms of um, feasibility. It's already done. I got a 
background check for a secret clearance or top secret SCI. It wasn't that hard. It was a questionnaire. More comprehensive background checks. Yeah, to a, to a limit, to a, to a point. What about red flag laws? No. No, not, a, not at all. How, how subjective are these red flag laws? Coming from somebody who has, according to the Veteran Affairs Office, post-traumatic stress disorder, I was diagnosed with PTSD when I walked into the office and answered the questions. Have you been to war? Yeah. Have you killed bad guys? Yeah. Have you seen dead people? Yes. Does it keep you up at night? Sometimes. Because that's what trauma normally does. Well, you got PTSD. So now what you're saying is every law-abiding veteran like myself who served in war, I run a company that teaches firearms training. I carry a gun everywhere. Hell, I have a pistol right here with me. Um, that now I could be potentially flagged. I've screwed up. I've been in arguments with my spouse, my ex-spouse. I've, uh, these things happen in life. And now you're saying because of a due process, which is haphazard at best, short-sighted at best, that I could be restricted from carrying or owning a firearm because somebody who potentially doesn't like me or a lawyer who potentially outpaces and prices me can potentially take away my guns and my right to self-defense. I don't like that. It's too subjective. It's sloppy. It's messy. Do do you want to put like, I'm a special forces veteran who killed bad guys for a living. If we had a liberal DA in town, I would be the first on their radar. You think I'm willing to take that chance as a law-abiding citizen in this country who pays a hell of a lot of taxes, who does a hell of a lot of good for my own community? Hell no. So what are we saying here? What we're saying is we're restricting ourselves and we're jumping on the bandwagon. And I don't like that. As I tweeted, I think it's twatted, the past tense of tweet is twat. As I twatted, um, I said... America is a superpower because of the sacrifice of the men and women from the Army, Marines, the Air Force, and the Navy that paid the ultimate sacrifice to defend our freedoms. An armed American is a secure America. And I truly believe that. What are the, what are the case in points? Libya, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Yemen as recent as Ukraine. What country on the planet Earth would think to invade a populace of armed and capable citizens who believe in freedom? Here's what I also know, working for the government. The government has reckless and irresponsible people that work for it because the government is the people. It's you and me. If you have dysfunction in your family, which you do, at your workplace, which you do, then you're going to have dysfunction in the government. And I don't want to outsource my protection to an institution that doesn't have a vested interest in defending my life or my family's life. I'll do that. Government, you worry about paying out, shelling out the welfare shelling out the food stamps, getting people hooked and addicted to the reliance that is the government institution, and I'll do me. How about we agree to disagree? You let me live my life in freedom because I fought for it, but every American who's been born into it has earned it. There's somebody else who sacrificed for it, and you leave us the hell alone. So now we're talking about assault weapons because assault weapons is the issue. How about the overarching agreement for everybody in the United States who's reasonable understands this is a mental health crisis that we are living in. Rates of suicide through the roof. Rates of drugs through the roof. How about we spend $40 billion in addressing those systemic issues instead of manufactured ones? Like all cops are racist. We push that narrative. How did that work out for us with record crime throughout the United States? I just want to be left alone. And I don't want my guns or my freedoms to be blamed 
for some radical nut job loser going into a school. Here's what I told the people in Dallas, Fort Worth at Black Dog Traders when I was talking to them about active shooting. 50% of active shootings throughout the United States utilize a semi-automatic pistol. About 25% are assault rifles, considered assault rifles. I don't even know what the hell that means. Because an AR-15 is a .223 rifle. So what do you mean assault rifle? It's a semi-automatic gun. There are not active shooters out here using automatic machine guns. So I also told them that if one teacher, one person had a firearm, a pistol, they could have easily stopped the shooting from even taking place. Following basic protocol would have helped. But worst case scenario, if one of those two teachers in that room were in a position, yeah, uh, th- th- he came in fast. I don't know the circumstances in which he initiated contact, but it happened seemingly fast. But if one of those teachers or somebody in the vicinity of him grabbed that pistol as their own first response to themselves and the protection of those children, there would be a very different outcome. They just had a situation recently that were reported by the news in the last 48 of the news cycle, very small coverage of a woman who shot and killed a criminal who opened fire on a party, a a wedding party, I believe, or graduation party with an AR-15. And she killed him before anybody was harmed or injured. 30 plus people would have been potentially injured or killed if not for that one woman who stopped that suspect who was opening fire on this graduation party. But we don't cover that because it doesn't fit the narrative. Anyways, I'm tired of that. Let's move on. So one of the questions I got outside of the news cap was regarding uh, anxiety and trauma. One of the things I talk about in self-protection is you are navigating not only the efficiency that you've built in practicing your tactical and technical reps, but you're also under a certain amount of stress going to potentially activate trauma in your psyche that is going to change or displace the way that you operate, potentially putting you in harm's way. Let me give you an example. If you have been traumatically injured or traumatized, abused verbally and physically, as a child, there might be something in you lying dormant that may cause an adverse reaction when your cortisol and your adrenaline, your neuroepinephrine spike in a fight, flight, or freeze response, a sympathetic nervous response. I've seen it happen. I've trained it and seen it happen with seemingly capable People have the aptitude, the physical fitness, the, the mindset as perceived, and then they fall apart under stress. Stress is typically not exercised in training, which is the detriment of training in the first place because you don't do anything technical or tactical without stress because it's the mobilization tactic that's meant to help you survive. It's going to be there. Even for the best in the world, it's going to be there. So when you train, you have to inoculate yourself in stress. When you do that, you could use physical exercise. You could use scorable targets. You could use time. Things that are going to elevate your stress. Peers watching you do what you do is going to help elevate your stress. And then you're going to see what you're really made of. One way to get through this is to do an exercise where you communicate it. You talk to your spouse. That's why therapy is so good. Because when you communicate what's in your heart, what's in your mind, and get it out, and you hear it for the first time, you develop a narrative or a structure around it that makes sense of complex, seemingly complex things. We as human beings like to dramatize everything in our lives because 
when we suppress something, it's often more emotionally based. It's not analytical. It's the depths of hell, the evils of men. When we should be saying to ourselves, look, man, it was a bad circumstance. That guy paid, that girl paid. It's life, the human condition where people are messed up. People make mistakes. I've made mistakes. Have you not made mistakes? So when you rationalize this and you kind of structure it and you say it out loud, I recommend getting a professional therapist and saying it out loud. You start to understand more about yourself. The first time I did counseling, you call it therapy, I guess, was with a Vietnam veteran at the Veteran Affairs when we were talking about PTSD because they wanted me get to talk to somebody, and I, I needed the help. I mean, I think we all need help, regardless of our experiences, because we all have an experience in trauma of some kind. But I remember talking to him and walking away from those meetings thinking, man, I feel better. It's like I just brushed my teeth. I just took a shower. And I felt clean, mentally refreshed. Because a lot of things I was holding on to, I was able to get out. That's how you're going to build resilience. That's how you're going to assist yourself in the worst case scenario. I've talked about this before in training. I've trained and operated with the best in the world. And I've also seen those best in the world fall apart in gunfights and rocket attacks. Because there's not a baseline. How are you supposed to train receiving a mortar round and being on the incoming end of that? You don't. You use artillery simulators. You walk through, crawl through, but you never run through. Until it's time, you won't know. And that's kind of how catastrophe is. Until the worst case scenario, you won't know how you're going to operate. So we need to build as much resilience in every facet of our lives as possible. And that's what we need, we need to accomplish. Training is not training without it. So if you want, here's a couple pro tips I'll leave, leave with you. Pick it up. When I'm going to lay down or not. One, breathe. You got to breathe. When you breathe, you're conscious. You're not acting subconscious or unconscious. The primal world of survival wants you to operate that way because you're just going to get in the way and also cost more time. So it efficiently and effectively wants to turn you off consciously so you're not thinking too much because you got to act. But in modern survival, a lot of us are put in situations where we need cognition. We need to think through problems. We need decisive action through planning in our heads. Hasty, hasty planning, of course, but we need to be aware. So we're fighting our primal and ancestral instinct and adaptive behavior. So I want you to breathe because that brings you back to reality. Also, I see a lot of people do it. I see it on flat ranges. I see it at the gym. I see it in social media. I see it throughout the world with all my interactions with people. We're our own worst enemies. We beat ourselves up. You need to be positive in your affirmation in haste, in the moment, and deliberately long term. Because how you treat yourself is how you're going to fall apart or stay resilient in the worst case scenario. If you say you're, you suck, you're not good enough, yeah, you're not going to be good enough. Because that little mechanism in you that's capable of fighting isn't going to fight because it's going to give up, it's going to quit. It's going to crawl into the fetal. But if you talk yourself up, if you tell yourself you're the best, maybe you're not, but you are the best, tell yourself that, then you'll fight. And you won't tap out. You'll stay in it. And that's where I want you to be. We're too soft, we're too weak. All it takes is a conversation with yourself to get yourself through it. And let your body fall apart when it falls apart. But keep your mind strong. Positive affirmation. One of the things I want to talk about on the podcast today is the family unit. The family unit is the most important element in our country that is going to shape our future forever. 
Let's talk about our own, our own trends, my own family, my own behaviors. When I was growing up as a kid in Daytona Beach, Florida, splitting the time and difference between my separated then mom and dad, mom lived in North Carolina, dad lived in Florida, I was surrounded by family. I grew up insulated in a very tight-knit family unit of loving people. My mom's sisters, my grandmothers, my uncles, my cousins, my friends and family were very tight-knit. Pool parties every weekend. Sleepovers, hangouts. You got in trouble, we helped each other out. On my grandma's side, she was the center of my family. When my grandmother died in 2006, all that changed. How much time have you spent with your family? Directly or indirectly? How much time do you talk to your mom or your dad or your family, your brothers, sisters on the phone? Most of us are so disconnected, we don't do that. Because family are problems. People are problems. And I get that. That's why Netflix is doing so well. That's why YouTube is doing so well. That's why uh, Grubhub and all these things where you just stay at home and you don't go out. But that has a detrimental impact on our family units. I think the family unit between a man and woman, or whatever you're into, I want to say man and woman because I believe that's important in the fabric of building our nation because we need men and women to procreate wonderful human beings. But if you happen to be gay, that's on you. You're, stu- you, you're still capable of raising and living a moral, ethical life and bringing people into this world who are going to be better prepared for it. So I don't care what your circumstance is, what your orientation is. Do you. But do so, do so the right way. Now I'm speaking. <laughs> um, I'm speaking as somebody who has been separated from the, 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 the children that I have, my, the mother of my children and I are not together. But that's okay. We're cooperative. We knew that staying together meant more negative behaviors that would affect our children. And I didn't want that. So dating a wonderful woman and separating from a toxic relationship, but being cordial and now friends has set my situation up for success. So yeah, we all navigate that. My mom and dad were divorced. I had stepmoms and stepdads on both sides of the family, but it was loving. One of the thing I one of the things I notice in my own children is when you do give them like number 1, there's no book to read on raising children. So if you didn't grow up in a good home, your home was broken and you don't understand because you don't have a good example of how to raise kids then you could be raising kids the wrong way. It's one of the reasons why um, within a couple years, after getting the, the real test and evaluation of what I'm doing and if, I'm, if what I'm doing is right, I want to write a book. I want to talk about this on podcast. What I've noticed about my own children is when I give them structure and discipline, right from wrong, morally, ethically, legally, then it gives them an environment that allows them to thrive. We think giving our children choices is freedom. That's not freedom. That's being displaced from the reality of what children need, which is guidance. People need guidance. Leading a company, for example, when you don't give guidance and constantly recheck your azimuth, sync in meetings and communicate to people, people lose it. They fall apart. Some people can operate that way. I don't need any guidance. I've always operated well without, with minimal guidance. But a lot of people in our world need the guidance, especially our children. So we want to say, well, let them be who they're going to be. No. This morning was the first time that I ever sat my, my son down and talked about boys and girls first time I got up and um, I was getting ready to get them out of the door and 
what a cluster. <laughs> what a cluster it is getting two twins out of the door for their daycare. So I'm trying to get them out of the door. And my son, I told my son to go put on shoes. And he goes and picks up one of his sister's jelly Cinderella shoes. I, I, he found the other one. I threw away the other one because it was just randomly in the garage. And I figured, oh, the other one's lost. And so he found the other one. And he's trying to put it on his foot. And I said, son, that's not your shoe. That's your sister's shoe. And now it's a pink jelly with sparkles all over it. Now, do I care that my son's wearing those type of shoes? No, but yes. I don't care if he's wearing them, but he's starting to identify with boy and girl, and he's communicating really well, even though he's three years old. And I said, son, that's not your shoe. That's your sister's shoe. And he said, no, no, that's my shoe. I want that shoe. And he started to cry a little bit, kind of, kind of getting uh, whiny. And so I sat him down. I said, son, this is your sister's shoes. You have boots. Go get your boot. And he goes, I want this. And I said, son, do you like boy shoes or girl shoes? And he said, I like girl shoes. And I looked at him and I said, son, these are girl shoes and you need to have boy shoes. And then I said, and this is me uh, communicating to a three-year-old. I don't baby talk my kids. My kids are very social. My, my son at the age of two could count to 30, and he knew his ABCs, A through Z, not just by sound, but he could identify the letter. Now he's into color. Both my uh, son and daughter are into shapes, colors, counting. I mean, my, my, my daughter carries around quarters and counts them out loud. She's an entrepreneur in the making. So I sat down and I said to my son, do you want to be Luca? You know, Luca. And Luca's a Disney movie about this little Italian boy that is like a half merman and half whatever. Do you want to be like Luca? You know, going out and you, you go, yay. Or do you want to be like Moana? Do you want to be a, like a little girl like Moana? And he thought about it and he goes, I want to be like Luca. I said, yeah, you want to be like Luca, like a little boy. These are not little boy shoes. These are Moana shoes. I'll get you your Luca shoes. And I went and got his shoes and handed it to him. And he goes, yeah, Luca shoes. And we worked through that. Is it groundbreaking? No, but I am guiding my child in the direction that I want him raised in. Now, sure. It's completely up to you because you're the parent. But the idea that your child, my son, who young men don't fully develop a prefrontal cortex, rational decision making until they're 25 years old, cannot be left alone to my child. Luckily for me, my dad raised me the same. My mom raised me the same. When I joined the army at the ripe old age of 17 years old, the army raised me from the ages of 17 until of recent. So it taught me discipline, loyalty, all of those things that you need in the fabric of a human being to be decent as a person. Not saying I'm perfect. There's a difference between morality and decency and character than making mistakes. Because I have sure effed up. But we need to guide our children. Here's an important fact that I discuss with the active shooting class in Dallas, Fort Worth, that not a lot of children uh, specialists, including law enforcement officers who teach active shooting, talk about. It's very easy to rehearse and script an active shooting scenario with teachers, with adults. At workplaces and universities, that's easy because they can understand what you're saying. They have the experience. They have the aptitude. They have the intelligence. What we're forgetting in active shooting responses that deal with children is that children are in a different place in their life, in their development, which means their response to stressors their decision-making, all of that, depending on the age that they are. 
So you take a fourth grader, which tragically this took place in a fourth grade classroom where the average age was 10 to 11 years old. And you ask yourself, who were you when you were 10? How did you act? How did you respond? Do you remember anything stressful or traumatic that took place at that age bracket? So we forget that when we are in a situation where gunshots are going off in a school, where children have just spiked in the transition from a parasympathetic state into a sympathetic state and fight, flight, or freeze, that they are in the most traumatic window of their life. So how do we train that? Well, we follow a technical protocol, but we don't talk about how we're going to make 10-year-olds move from being frozen underneath a desk to activating physical responses, activating cognitive open-mindedness. So we don't have that understanding because we're not focused on the actual problem. We are checking the block. So some things that you could do at your home is start conditioning your children for what it takes to operate in those circumstances. And it doesn't have to be a simunitions active shooting hit scenario in order to evoke those or elicit those type of responses to measure whether or not our children are going to be likely or unlikely and then build the resilience that's needed. If I say to my child, son, how are you going to react? This Imagine my son's 10. What are you going to do when something happens? Like somebody comes into a school and starts shooting. What are you going to do? And for a lot of parents, that would be difficult to have that conversation. I would imagine the more disaffected you are from reality, maybe even slight correlation here to being, to leaning more left, leftist, extreme ideology, believe in a utopia, the disassociation from reality. They don't want to dig in the weeds of the facts. So imagine if you're on the far left of this discussion or debate, you're not talking to your kids because you want your kids to live a great life and you want them to imagine that everything's perfect. And so do I, I want my daughter and son, whenever they go to their daycare to imagine that their lives are like living in Moana on the islands in fantasy world. Because I want to insulate and protect them as much as possible. And that includes their innocence. But I also want to have, just like with the shoe, rational discussions and conditioning their responses as I see fit to optimize their survival. So the contrasting argument there is don't do it at all. And allow your child to be at the mercy of of hopefully a squared away teacher that's going to give them the right guidance. I made this example and analogy in uh, the discussion I had in Dallas, Fort Worth with the group there. I said, uh, imagine you're trying to raise a child and imagine my experience in raising children in the infantry. Let's say you have three children. As a team leader in the infantry, I had essentially three children. But how did I lead and affect them? Like, te- like technically, like literally, how did I do that? I did that by developing battle drills with them in practice. Immediate responses that were activated by specific things that took place in the environment. I got shot at on the go while I was on patrol. I looked at direction and distance of the threat, moved to cover, individually moved, and suppressed the enemy while I was moving to a covered and concealed position. Called out the distance and direction and composition of the bad guys, and then worked through different battle drills depending on the desired outcome. So with that being said, how do we look at our children? If the objective for our children in catastrophe is surviving, What conditioning have you done? 
If you haven't even had the conversation, how do you know at all that your children are going to make it? They're going to survive. I imagine that the young girl who called out for help as described by one of the witnesses, another child that was in the school, potentially in the same classroom, where police officers said, yell out if you hear me. And the child said, over here or help. And then as described by the other child, the shooter went to that child and killed them. That if one conversation with your young son or daughter was, son, remember, there's good people and there's bad people. When a bad person wants to hurt people, they're going to do everything possible to trick them. They might even call out and say, wherever you're at, let me know. If you know the person is bad, don't respond. If you know the person is good, but the bad person is around, don't respond. Why would I want to do that? And then work and navigate their own cognition, thoughts, and ideas. Well, I don't know. Maybe I don't want them to know where I'm at. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to give away where we're at if we're hiding. If we're hiding, we don't want anyone to know where we're at except the good people. So I want you to hide. Son, let's talk about disaster. If something happens bad at the school and you have the opportunity to get away by yourself, I want you to do that. Remember, where danger is, that's where the X is. We want to get away from the X, the landing site where all the bad takes place as fast as possible. The further away I can get, the safer I will be. If you have the opportunity to run, I want you to run as fast as possible, faster than you've ever ran in your life. And when this happens, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be excited. Your heart is going to feel like you're about to have a heart attack. Your heart's beating out of your chest. But that is your body allowing you to run faster. We're going to practice that, okay? We're going to go outside and we're going to practice. When I say danger and you say danger, I want you to run as fast as you can to the fence. Ready? Danger. And then he goes. I want you to navigate these conversations. And then I want you to rehearse and practice building the wherewithal and resilience in your young children so they can be best prepared. When I was growing up in South Daytona Elementary School, we had firefighters and first responders that would come in and give us blocks of intru- instruction. I remember the day that I was chosen to be a volunteer for stop, drop, and roll. And how much pressure I felt. Like, oh my gosh, I, got, I have to stop, drop, and roll in front of all my peers. But that pressure, which is stress, is good for you. That mobilization tactic for your primal survival is good for you. And then when you do get through that, when I did stop, drop, and roll, and I practiced that technical move, I never forgot it for the rest of my life. Stop, drop, and roll. And it felt good to get up off my feet and demonstrate under stress, moving my physical body and getting and shedding a lot of that nervousness. If fight, flight, or freeze is the mobilization tactic for survival, then one of the beneficial things that you could teach your kids is to move. To move. One of the detriments of active shooter training in the country is the idea that bunkering down without protection, meaning without a firearm, is going to protect you. It's not. Those teachers should have been throwing desk through the windows when they heard the gunshots next door. Based on the new police videos that are being released now, showing the police response, that's what they did. A lot of officers uh, bravely 
ran to windows and started pulling and ripping children out of the classroom. Thank God that shooter wasn't able to leave the other classroom. The chief of police of that school district now is coming out saying that he made the call to barricade and that the troopers, I believe it was 77, 78 minutes, an hour and 18 minutes from the time that he entered the class to the time he was killed, that the officers were told to stand down because now it was a barricaded subject. If you barricade your children inside of a classroom, a person hell bent on evil with a gun is not going to be stopped by your lock, your door, your obstacle. You know what will stop them? Intelligent protocols and a pistol. An armed security officer always on site roving the school. It's now coming out that there wasn't an officer at that school. At the time. Apparently there was one assigned and even months prior they practice active shooter training. As described by the DPS director in a press conference who was absolutely correct, the only thing that stops an active shooting is when good guys confront the bad guy and kill him. Period. There's no giving up. Because the, the saying of what it is denotes the activity. Active shooting. Just because there's a lull in fi- a fire doesn't mean you get a timeout. It means, I assume, because you've already showed the propensity for violence by demonstrating it, that I'm going to interdict you and stop you by killing you. He made that apparent and very clear, which is true. This is how we teach officers. It doesn't matter. Your background experience, when you show up and people are dying, your job as a law enforcement officer is to risk your life. Even in the priorities of life, number two is the law enforcement officer. Number one, innocent life. Because they don't have the ability to protect themselves with firearms. Because they're restricted, they're not able to do it, or they just won't. But what do those officers do on site as told by the chief? They stood down. Man, I'd hate to be that chief right now. Hell, I'd hate to be those officers. And if you're justifying it, you're wrong. Let's just be honest. If you're saying to your peers at that uh, police department, that's what we are told to do, you're wrong. Because at the moment in which you knew in your head that what you were doing was wrong, which you did, when you were standing idle while there were still gunshots, which has been reported as happening after the fact when they declared it was barricaded, you're wrong. Now, is it your fault? No, it's not your fault. But was it irresponsible? Yes, absolutely was. You got to live with that. You got to live with that for the rest of your lives. Thank God the Bortac agents that showed up, which I've worked with Bortac, I've shot the use, well, I, I've shot comps with them. I've worked with them. I haven't done operations with them, but I've worked with them. They are some of the most capable law enforcement officers in the federal government with the equipment and certainly the skills and experience. They defied that chief's orders and went in anyway. Good for them. There's even reports of officers that had children there that just went in and did business to get their children out. Good God. Can you imagine showing up on scene and the chief saying, stand down because it's barricaded? I would literally, literally go out of my way to make sure that chief on site knew what was up as I was getting inside of a vehicle. I don't care if you have to breach the walls, the windows crash a vehicle through the classroom in order to get those kids out and to kill that bad guy. But that's the only thing that should have happened. Well, Mike, don't you think that's a little brazen and bold for law enforcement officers? No. That's what they sign up to do. That's what they sign up to do, and they know it. Thank God for those Bortac agents who did that. Now imagine a classroom full of kids from different backgrounds and experiences who aren't taught by good parents. 
those kids are liabilities. That teacher's a liability. That protocol is a liability to the survival of your child, which is why you got to get involved. Not just for your kids, but for all the kids. You have to get involved. You have to communicate to the school board, to the principals. I have a hundred emails sitting in my inbox right now from schools throughout the country. We're training with Wasatch Elementary right down the road because of this. We have schools in every single state that have reached out to me and us at Philcraft Survival to put on this training. And that's what I owe you. I'm going to be doing free online training, free Zoom consultations, and some of these schools that are in the vicinity of me while I'm in the area, I will do teaching blocks of instruction and educate educators, including teachers, superintendents, law enforcement officers, as well as civilians. I'll have different breakdowns that will be in unlisted YouTube links that you could disseminate in your organizations once you reach out to me. And I'm shooting those, the videos for those, next week. I have a vested interest because I have children, but I care about this country and children surviving to do this, but so should you. You're capable of doing that. Listen, I'm not going to preach to the choir. But all this starts with a good family unit. When did it become so unpopular to build a family? To train your family members? To overland, off-road, camp, homestead, do security plans with your kids? Get your family involved in everything preparedness. It's not that difficult, and it's fun. In Dallas, Texas, we'll have a child program. Teaching children and families to be better prepared because you have to condition your children because they don't have the cognition nor the capability because they don't have the experience and the aptitude. We'll start that program in Dallas, Texas as well. We'll bring that content to you online. It's our commitment to you guys. I love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Uh, I will shamelessly plug, because I'd I'd use it every night, The Wolf 21. Um, I created a CBD, CBN company, The Wolf 21, to help you sleep, because it helped me sleep. I hadn't slept in years. Yesterday was the exception of sleeping good, because I didn't sleep good on Memorial Day. It was tough. Oh, I was going to, let me use this last couple minutes to talk about that. Memorial Day. Um, did a post on Memorial Day, and for those that served, especially those that lost teammates, um, every day is Memorial Day, and that's okay. I want to feel that pain. I want to be reminded all the time. What I'm going to start doing on the podcast is talking war stories with you guys and bringing up some of those legacy interactions I had with the most amazing human beings on the planet that I served with that were killed. I know over a dozen people that I served with that I was directly working with that were killed in combat by half of those buddies of mine. And I want to tell you their stories and my personal interactions so their kids, their family members could hear those stories and you could tell them, retell them at the dinner table to keep these warriors, men, um, memories alive. And that's important to me. And I appreciate all the support on Memorial Day. I didn't sleep good, even with CBD, CBN, because it's difficult. Go to thewolf21.com, CBD, CBN. You look at the links uh, below. I appreciate you guys. Until next time. Peace out, guys. Have a good week. 